I would like to thank um, all the se uh, principal secretaries who are here and also our distinguished uh, guests from, um, from CWAC and also the representative um, of uh, IOM who were with us this morning and all of you for coming and being part of this uh, official opening of the symposium. Provide a forum for sharing information, lessons, experiences, and best practices in combating trafficking in persons. As you will notice, there are participants, not only from Malawi, but from beyond as well, who will share their experiences in efforts to fight trafficking in persons. And so this provides an opportune time for us to learn how they have approached trafficking in persons given the unique forms and trends of trafficking in their countries. And so we can relate to that and find a common ground to finding solutions to this problem. The second is to explore opportunities and synergies for strengthening global, regional, and national collaboration in combating against trafficking persons. Emonat, as a network, we are very grateful to government for our involvement at all levels of interventions in the fight against trafficking in persons. Our network believes in the spirit of partnership to strike back at this crime against human dignity and to those who benefit from it. This symposium is therefore very important to us as key stakeholders in the fight against trafficking in persons in Malawi. We will wisely use this occasion to share experiences, share notes during what happened during the year, um, learn from the global experts and prepare ourselves for the implementation of the national plan of action against trafficking in persons. Ladies and gentlemen, all my seniors, the network, which is MNAT, is therefore very grateful once again to the Conference of Western Attorneys, journals, for not only sponsoring the symposium, but also sending experts in anti-trafficking in persons efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, there could not be a better time than this time to MNAT when we have amidst us experts in anti-trafficking in persons issues. We there, therefore commit MNAT to support the state in the implementing both the National Plan of Action Against Trafficking in Persons and enforcement of the Trafficking in Persons Act, also to fully support the conference Western Attorney General's CWAG achievement of its plan for Malawi and Africa. So CWAG stands for the Conference of Western Attorneys General. Uh, it's been around over 20 years. It's an organization that started in the United States, primarily focused on the 15 Western states in the United States, working with state attorneys general's offices, offices training, assistant attorneys generals, working with the leadership in the offices to build capacity, uh, working on issues related to the rule of law. Uh, issues related specifically to the West in the United States, everything from uh, water rights, land rights, mineral rights, uh, and but but over the years, uh, the Conference of Western Attorneys General has expanded. Uh, they've been very very successful in in, in training uh, state attorneys generals in the West, and and so now fast forward, you have just about every state. Is a in the United States is a member of the Conference of Western Attorneys General. So, and they didn't stop there. So ultimately, the Conference of Western Attorneys General expanded beyond the borders of the United States and started doing some international work. 
starting with Mexico, uh, where we've been involved, the Alliance Partnership with Mexico, we've been involved in uh, a lot of training of the Mexican attorneys generals, uh, working with the Mexican judges, uh, working with police and prosecutors, again, on capacity building, trial advocacy, um, issues related to, um, to drug trafficking, gang interdiction, and a, a whole host of issues. So we've, we had a lot of success there. And so we said, why not the continent of Africa? We had a lot of state attorneys generals very interested uh, in, the, in a relationship with the continent uh, realizing that uh, the world that we live in uh, is shrinking. It's becoming more of a global village and that we're all interconnected. So we started the Alliance, the Africa Alliance Partnership. And we've been, it's, it's been running for about two years now. And we're in about nine countries uh, addressing issues such as human trafficking, uh, issues such as, <clears throat> as money laundering, uh, transborder crimes, um, issues related um, to uh, trafficking of wildlife, uh, and, and much, much more. So we, we've been in Kenya, South Africa, uh, obviously Malawi, Zambia. We were just in Rwanda on, on issues related to um, money laundering. And so we continue to grow and expand, and the idea um, is that we want to build a, a relationship and help um, countries build capacity. We want to share best practices. Uh, we basically have two tracks, right? We do training, which oftentimes is, is training young prosecutors on, on basic trial advocacy skills, um, training on how to bring and prosecute a human trafficking case, how to um, handle a money laundering, uh, a case involving money laundering. Uh, but we also do larger symposiums where we exchange ideas on the large issues of the day, uh, where it's more about bringing awareness, uh, similar to what we're going to do here uh, today. We acknowledge the commitment of the National Coordination Committee Against Trafficking in Persons in Malawi, who worked relentlessly on the plan of action and urged them to continue their good work as we work towards our ultimate goal of elimination of trafficking in persons. Let me also take this opportunity to thank our development partners who have been working with us, especially also in the Ministry of Justice. This far in this goal towards eradicating trafficking in persons, and it is my hope that our partners will continue to work with us to achieve the goals set in the National Plan of Action. It is pleasing to note that the Plan of Action acknowledges a much needed holistic approach to the interventions by all stakeholders towards eliminating trafficking in persons in Malawi. The National Human Rights Action Plan also lays out concrete measures to eliminate trafficking in persons. The National Human Rights Action Plan will operate in consonance with the National Plan of Action against trafficking in persons. As we work towards eliminating trafficking in persons as a nation, we all need to work together. This is why this momentous occasion is vital so that we forge partnerships share and exchange ideas across various disciplines on practices to be adopted to effectively combat trafficking in persons. The goal set by the Plan of Action to eradicate trafficking by 50% by 2022 is only achievable if we all work together. I would like to commend the Ministry of Home Affairs in collaboration with Malawi Network Against Trafficking in Persons, MNAT, with support from Conference of Western Attorneys Generals, CWAG, US, for organizing this symposium. May the discussion to be held today be fruitful as we work towards our ultimate goal of eliminating trafficking in persons. 
I am particularly delighted because this symposium today marks the beginning of a long-term and fruitful relationship between the government of Malawi through my ministry and the Conference of Western Attorneys General. My ministry is fully committed to the fight against trafficking in persons in this country. Therefore, I am looking forward to a very strong partnership between us in areas such as capacity building of investigators, prosecutors, enforcement, and protection officers. Let me thank the Conference of the Western Attorneys General, USA, uh, SWAG's primary function in Africa, and in this case Malawi, is to establish and foster relationships with justice and law enforcement agencies and officials to support the rule of law and combat transnational criminal activity such as human trafficking, drug trafficking, and corruption, among others. Further, my gratitude extends to the Malawi Network Against Trafficking in Persons this symposium, therefore, would not have taken place without the support of SWAG and MANAT. I know that your continued support, we will achieve our objectives. In the United States, um, for uh, human trafficking, we look at it uh, to prevent sexual abuse of children, uh, child sexual trafficking, child pornography. While in uh, Malawi you recently passed the Human Trafficking Act in the United States in the year 2000, the federal government passed the Trafficking Victims and Protection Act. And there uh, we defined human trafficking, we created new crimes related to trafficking uh, and, importantly, uh, created remedies. Now, the Attorney General's Office in the District of Columbia, uh, like many other uh, state Attorney General's offices, uh, we are responsible for juvenile crimes. That is, uh, persons who are under the age of 18. We do work uh, both on, on the prosecution side, but also on behalf of children. Uh, essentially, uh, the laws surrounding the child welfare system, dealing with abuse, neglect, and foster care. Now, the uh, foster care system is uh, really picking up from what I heard some of the prior speakers talking about, uh, that is where you find many victims of trafficking. And what we have found is that 50 to 90 percent of trafficking victims have come from the foster care system. And if you really take a moment to think about that, these are children who are you know, wards of the state and put in the care of the government who are the ones who are ending up uh, being trafficked. Um, so it is almost uh, the pathway uh, to trafficking. One of the areas that we are working a lot uh, in the District of Columbia's Attorney General's Office is sex trafficking of children. And essentially, uh, teenagers, many times these are also teenagers who have come from the child abuse and neglect system, um, or just, you know, in middle school, in high school, uh, children who are looking for a, a place or a person to love them, that they are groomed for tra trafficking. Uh, really starting off, uh, particularly young girls, the age of 14, 15, 16, where um, they're believing that there is um, somebody who's their boyfriend. The issue of trafficking in persons is a 
not uh, new even in the religious circles. Let me say so. In the Bible, exploitation of the Israelites is really there, very clear. And uh, we've seen God also being concerned with the social issues affecting the people. And uh, as a church, there are things that we are doing to combat the same. Uh, among them, we have normally preaching in the pulpit, teaching as well. That is not enough. We also engage or involve choirs to come up with songs that will bring awareness to the people. So this is what we are doing as a church. And uh, this is in church and as well as other open air activities, such as when we have funerals. There as well, the preaching should also be towards combating the same. So this is how we do it as a church. As the indicated area, I, came, I come from the, I'm um, here representing the CCAP family, the five synods in Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. I am in the secretariat as Deputy Secretary General. Looking at the issue as a global one, as already indicated, we are also going uh, uh, beyond the borders of Malawi to other synods and countries as indicated doing the same thing for we know we are all falling victims to this uh, evil of uh, trafficking in persons. So as a church, that's what we are doing, teaching, preaching, songs, and doing whatever things that we can do to make it wake up. Not only that, we are also trying to help out with the, the victims. You know, the trafficking, the vulnerability to be as such, it is an issue of the environment in which one is found. The trafficking in persons might oftentimes be the product of something that one has been going through. So we need also to look into such issues. We are in a time where HIV and AIDS has claimed the claim of the society, breadwinners for that matter, and this is also a contributing factor. Your neko deals with the very vulnerable groups, and these are youth, women, and, and children. And in the context of trafficking, that puts them at high risk of um, uh, um, uh, trafficking because of uh, it's very easy to deceive them, especially the children and the, and the youth, and also the women that have easily been deceived into to something else. Vulnerability comes because of uh, one, poverty, illiteracy levels, which is education, and also uh, the environment in which they are operating in the context of uh, um, uh, trafficking. Let, let me I start by saying that uh, looking at the work that we are doing as Yoneko, I would want to place uh, prevention of trafficking at three levels. First, uh, let me talk about uh, primary prevention, which focuses on issues of poverty, uh, which underpin uh, trafficking, and therefore the issues uh, relating to economic activities are key in, in Yoneko to be able to deal with issues of trafficking. Again, in terms of primary pr pr prevention, I would also want uh, us to focus a little bit. We do a lot of work around the community empowerment approach. The community empowerment approach uh, creates uh, an environment where trafficking can be prevented. So you are looking at uh, awareness raising, which I think, Natalie, you talked quite a lot about. Uh, communities are empowered with information to make sure that they respond to issues of trafficking. 
uh, setting up what we call community vigilantes. These are community groups that would be able to say, hang on, something is happening here. When they see someone strange in the community, what, how do they react? So the community structures, community rights committees, community child protection committees, ensuring that they're empowered with information to be able to deal with that. Um, trafficking has got a lot of uh, counseling aspect, and therefore we also use counseling as a key uh, prevention tool. So looking at what Natalie was talking, engaging the uh, victims and, and the like, we use a lot of counseling techniques to make sure that they don't fall victims again of, of the trafficking. Then issues of education uh, is, is an element uh, uh, of our programming. Then the, the big component that we forget in most cases, which I think Natalie also highlighted too, is the issue of the parent. Where does the parent fall in this context? I mean, working in Mangochi, Machinga, you go to a village in Katuli and someone comes from Blantyre and says, convinces the parent that no, I think there is very good work in Blantyre and um, you can send your child. So that again is an issue of engaging the parents at community level to make sure that parents are aware of the issues of trafficking and then they are able to respond to that. We also do quite a lot of work in terms of prevention, uh, dealing with the, the demand side, where the tra the, these are now the traffickers who are demanding the services. So by uh, supporting efforts of punitive um, uh, punishment, um, actually I was embarrassed last week when one police officer said, you know in Machinga Zomba Mangochi, people are afraid of Yoneko more than the police. And I said, hang on, I'm not a policeman. Uh, why should we be afraid of? But what we are known for is to do advocacy, to make sure that uh, even the courts will follow you quite closely and even say, hang on, this, this sentence is not, we think it's not adequate. And I know sometimes we have stepped on your toes, um, Austin, because of that. But uh, we, we think that it's important that we do advocate for punitive uh, punishment. The name and shame, uh, media coverage and the like is our name and shame strategy to prevent uh, trafficking because we also have to deal with that. Then you also have to look at uh, the secondary component of trafficking which uh, then looks at issues of uh, reporting and creating spaces uh, for uh, uh, trafficking. So for example, Yoneko is the manager of hotlines. We actually have three hotlines and I was happy Natalie that the, the issues that we have in our hotlines were actually highlighted because I know internally when we were discussing the three hotlines, people were like, hang on, why do you want a drug hotline to be inclusive? And yet we know that trafficking and drug and substance abuse go hand in hand. So we have three lines. Uh, one is 116, which is a child helpline. The other one is 5600, which is a gender-based crisis hotline. And then you have 6600, which is the, um, um, a drug and substance uh, hotline. The first hotline, 116, is free to the caller and to everybody else because the Malawi government adopted it uh, in 2011. It's a Ministry of Gender uh, hotline uh, which is responsible for that and therefore MACRA is paying fully for that. We want to appreciate MACRA for that. I thought Maxwell was going to give uh, an award to MACRA because that, that is quite key having given that. But 5600 and 6600, they are currently being supported by development partners and we would want to invite all of you to do advocacy to make sure that those hotlines are free. Because um, if they are free to the caller and free to us, it will be far much easier to provide the service in that context. Then we also have safe homes. Uh, we have um, uh, one safe home which was purposely constructed in the north. And then we have got a safe home in, in Zomba. We also have uh, help Malawi government to manage the social help center as a place of security safety uh, for that. Then we, the other component that we also do that I would also want to share is support the implementation of the a child online protection. And I saw the poster that was going on around and I said, my, my God, the child online protection is to make sure that children are protected online. And the currently, uh, the MACRA and the means of information are uh, championing that, but Yoneko is already advanced in terms of uh, creating the tools that are supposed to be available for that. I told you, Austin, that it's not good to give teachers short period. The other thing is uh, focusing on those that have been trafficked as a prevention mechanism, a secondary prevention mechanism. Because when they have been trafficked and they come back, 
what do you do? You just leave them? When you leave them, you are putting them at risk again of being trafficked because the, the issues have not been addressed. So in those people that have been trafficked and have come back, we are looking at issues of counseling as a critical component to ensure that they are not trafficked back to, the, to, to where they were and also looking at the livelihood opportunities because those are key in, 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 in that co context. The issue that I want to raise that we need to probably think about a little bit more, I know that as your NECO, we have now developed an application, uh, which is an Android application that can be used for that particular group. But this is for people who are uh, high class, whom we assume that they are not uh, at risk. But I want to tell you that uh, one of the things that I have uh, um, uh, tr uh, tr uh, gotten into is where a child in area 10, and sorry if you are living in area 10, when a child in area 10, 12 um, calls and says, you know we are tired of our parents locking us in the house and thinking we are going to be talking to the videos and television. These are children who are living in, the, who, who are living in the high places, middle and high class people who have access, unfortunately I left my phone there, have access to tablets, they have access to high tech technology, and they are at very high risk of getting into to be trafficked because they are on their own. You don't know what they are doing, and you need to monitor that in terms of primary prevention. Let me quickly mention that one colleague uh, called me and said, my, my daughter is always in the bedroom with her iPad. She loves it. And so I said, oh, okay. Then I said, can you go and check what she's looking at? So I gave her some tips in terms of, uh, I told you I'm 12 years, so when it comes to IT, um, my IT team has made me to know it a little bit more. So I went into the iPad and looked at what is there, only to, when I told her to do that, guess what? It was all pornography on the iPad for a 11-year-old girl. Uh, you can imagine what happened next. Thank you. I'm Tuonge Tembo from Love Justice International. And um, I think on the program it says we're Tiny Hands International. So that is our previous name. We've had a name change. Um, I hope you can just scratch Tiny Hands out and put Love Justice International on the program so that you can know and understand who we are. But yeah, so we started actually in 2004 internationally in Nepal. And now we're moving our projects basically in Malawi. So your question might be, what does Love Justice do? Love Justice focuses specifically in transit monitoring or border monitoring. As you all understand, trafficking works in a specific way. So the modus operandi, you could say, is you are first tricked or manipulated, then you are transported, moved from point A to point B, and then you are actually trapped, then from being trapped, you're sold. So Tiny Hands, now Love Justice, comes into the point where people are being moved from one location to the next location. That is very effective because you actually prevent the victim from being exploited to the place where they're actually going. You understand in trafficking, you have post-traffic, you have, uh, is it post-trafficking intervention and uh, pre-trafficking intervention. We believe pre-trafficking intervention is much better than post-trafficking interventions because of the costs. When you actually stop a person from getting to the next location of being trafficked, you actually assist the whole process in the person will not have to be rehabilitated. The person can be um, can be sent back into the com to the community uh, a, a better person in the sense of they have a, a, the awareness of knowing that this is trafficking. This is how trafficking happens, and they can actually become educators in their community. But when you talk of post trafficking, what basically happens is you're dealing with someone who has gone through uh, very traumatic experiences. So I'll explain later as we go on with the discussion, but. Love Justice is here primarily to stop traffickers as they're moving the person. How, we'll, how we do this, we have an intercept record form, which is in front of me. I cannot share this form with um, anyone here but our partners, uh, and I'm sorry that I cannot do that. But this particular form highlights red flags, because you ask me, how do you know if this person is a traffic victim or this person is not a traffic victim? There are red flags, there's specific signs that you can actually see, you can address, you can observe, and that particular person is intercepted, stopped, and our monitors bring the person in for questioning with our partners in the, in the police services and our social workers. So the act already specifies that if you have to um, 
if you have to state that this person is actually a victim of trafficking, it, it, has, to be, um, it has to be assessed by a social worker and the police. And then they can actually come to the conclusion that this is actually a victim of trafficking. The chiefs, and then they'll tell them that there's job opportunities in Mozambique. Then they'll traffic those kids. So even though there could be village vigilantes, but then those cannot control the chiefs' uh, actions. So at the end of the day, these people were being transported to Mozambique because there's a vast border there where, which can be controlled as well. Those, those people are going, going into Mozambique. So how is the organization dealing with such other incidences? Uh, from what you said, I didn't get any specific uh, information regarding what the church is doing uh, in reaching out to the vulnerable groups such as uh, the, the youth and the women. The other speakers are likely part of that, but from the church's point of view, I haven't heard that. And then to uh, my other uh, colleague there, my question also uh, relates to what our colleague has said. Most of our borders in Malawi, especially again the north, they are very porous. And we have so many people you know, crossing, you know, whether Somalis, Ethiopians. Now I just want to find out from you, how do you tackle that issue? To, uh, bear in mind that the outbuilders are very porous and then they work with immigration officers, police officers, but in situations like in Karonga, uh, Sanj and Chid, we don't have those uh, officers. Thank you. NAPTIP's operation, NAPTIP's mandate is centered on five strategies. We have a five-pronged strategy, which is policy, partnership, prosecution, protection, and prevention. This is in line with the United Nations and the International Acceptable Standards of Trafficking in Persons and the Fight Against Trafficking in Persons. You find out that these uh, intervention principles, intervention mechanisms are centered around these five Ps, we call them. Five Ps. This is policy. In policy, what do we mean? Policy, Nigeria has certain policies, certain documents, regulations, uh, white papers that we use to make sure that issues of human trafficking are being really fought to the standstill. Prevention. This is a key tool in fighting trafficking. I was here, I, I heard the panelists when he was talking about detection, he was talking about um, uh, making sure, because if you don't detect, if you don't prevent, then you cannot cure. So if you prevent, at least you nip, you nip the attendant effects or whatever in the board. So now prevention is the mainstay of our mandate. We use conferences, workshops, advocacy, grassroots sensitization, mass media campaigns aimed at creating public awareness. Then we have various prevention methods, then traditional media, TV, radio jingles, and all that. These are the things that make and that enlighten people on the ills and dangers of trafficking, for them to be aware that this hydra-headed monster is with, is with us and we should avoid it, we should make sure that we avoid it and then be safe in the society. Protection. How do we go about protection? We provide shelter and protection for the rights of trafficked persons and other rehabilitation and reintegration into society. Protection strategies employed by the agency include, we have a natural referral mechanism. When you find victims, you find victims are brought to the agency. We collaborate a lot with especially NGOs and uh, non, uh, other faith-based organizations who have trafficking in persons and um, rehabilitation of victims or care of victims of trafficking as their main objects. So we work in tandem with them. We work in association with them. Then we have a mechanism of always giving them cases. And then we have shelters. We have nine zonal commands across the Federation and we have victims of trafficking shelters by which we keep these traffic victims. When they are rescued from their traffickers in the course of trafficking, when they are being taken out of the borders, out of the shores of the country, you find out that when they are rescued, you don't put them back into the society, you don't make them vulnerable again by making them be vulnerable to the same traffickers who trafficked them before. So they are put in safe houses, we'll call them, and 
they are rehabilitated, they are reintegrated, and then they are empowered. Some of them have skill acquisition programs to do for them. We have the, some of the social protection measures we have in the country, we have in NAPTIP or we adopt state-driven anti-trafficking child protection committees. We galvanize these committees, we put them together, we let them know what it takes to deal with victims. Then we have free education policy at basic level. When you get these victims, we make sure that most of them, or some of them who are willing to, to further their education, we, we cater for their education. There's one remarkable thing we have in, in our law, which is the Victims of Trafficking Trust Fund, which is used to cater for, their, for the welfare of victims of trafficking. These, traffickings, these victims, they don't have much. At the end of the day, there is no hope for them after their hopes are shattered, after they are exploited, after they are used up, after their lives, uh, their dreams are truncated, they come back to the country, you find out that they need some hope. So we make sure we step up the hope by providing these social reintegration mechanisms to them. This is our victim rehabilitation process. From reception, identification, sheltering, and health checks, counseling empowerment, reunion, family tracing, counseling, follow-up disengagement. It's a gradual procedure from one step to another. We identify the needs, we identify where and what each person needs. Where are your strengths? What do you need as a victim? We go on. And these are statistics. We have about rescued victims across all other countries in Africa. Because Nigeria is like the hub in Africa. Nigeria, going by the population, the most populous country in black Africa, in the black world. We are the hub. We find that there are a lot of trafficking to these neighboring states, Ghana. We have Burkina Faso, Togo, Mali, and all that. So these are the number of victims we've recovered over the years from there. We've recovered about 357 in the past, uh, since inception. Prosecution. This is one of the most effective ways of dealing with human trafficking. One of the most essential functions of the law is the deterrent function it serves. Law is meant to serve the deterrent function. When people are put behind bars, when people are made to be responsible for their acts, for their actions, for the infraction of the law, you find out that people, it, it tends to kind of clip the wings of these human traffickers. So we go on and we prosecute. Not just prosecuting, we, not just, just, not just prosecution, we go on to make sure that assets of these traffickers are seized. There are special procedures for that. They have assets and we do assets tracing. And while in the course of investigation, in the course of prosecution, we'll make sure that we obtain an interim attachment order, attach the properties in court, and then the court will make a final for future order. And the good thing about this is there's a special victims of trafficking trust fund where the proceeds of this seized and disposed properties of traffickers are paid into for the general well-being of the victims. Uh, my name is Monica Namandwa. I'm a first-year law student at Chancellor College. Uh, the way that I understand human trafficking is that it's a process and an act of um, transporting uh, persons from one area to another or transporting them from one uh, country to another for the purpose of um, exploiting them in terms of labor and also exploiting them in terms of, um, let's say, sexual practices. My name is Neba Jiram. I'm the secretary of the Students Law Society from Chancellor College. Uh, uh, for me, I think, just an extension to what she said, Human trafficking doesn't involves a lot of facets. For example, sometimes people are being taken to brothels, for example, uh, where they do sexual activities of, diff of various natures with various clients, and they get paid. But at the end of the day, they still pay the owner of that brothel, which in, in itself is another form of exploitation, simply because that person is benefiting from the clientele that is the women are bringing. But furthermore, uh, he's, getting also, he's also getting paid from the women's proceeds, which is another form of exploitation. Furthermore, the tenant system uh, in Malawi, in the, in the tobacco states and in the 
city estates in Cholo and Kasungu, you find that there's a lot of exploitation which is going on there. People are being are being taken from different districts of the country and being taken to the to the estates where they they are working at mere at mere girl mere salaries, and then they're also exploited in the in the form that they also have to pay uh, rent to the owner of the of the of the estate, which is another form of exploitation, and it's also a form of human trafficking.